Groovy. Started the chapter eight review. Let's go. It's, okay. I'm confused on um, a few things, mainly with the covalent radius. Ooh, noise. I don't understand the stuff, and I'm struggling to find it in the book. Because it explains it when it starts talking about Z sub F. Yo. So let me pull thing up. Why? Come on. Mm, where am I? Who am I? That's not what I want. That's what I want. I don't want to make this thing disappear for a second. Oh, boy. Window capture. Go away. Not Yahtzee. There we go. Uh, cause you're lo looking at question number or item number 18. Uh, well, it starts back on five oh, well, and there then you go. it goes for essentially most of it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, so yeah, yeah. that's where I'm struggling with okay. that idea. Fit. All right. Okay. Um, so... Uh, you know what I should also do is bring up a periodic table. That is what I should also do. Apparently, that's a periodic table. Okay. Hmm. Gonna need you to not act a fool here thing okay whatevs uh, but it's got the green thing on it again that's really bumming me out that the green screen is taking the green off the periodic tables or off of things that one's a little bit better okay dope um, the green looks black but whatevs Let's see here. Will it, oh, no, because of... All right, whatever. Um, so here's our periodic table. And here in five. So the, the whole... Well, not the whole of chapter eight, because there's electron configurations in chapter eight, too. The biggie in chapter eight is... Um, what happens as we go left, right, up, down on the periodic table. Yeah. So we start talking about size of atoms because that's one thing that's pretty easy to see. So if the size of the atom, and by definition, it's covalent radius. Okay, covalent radius is going to be the radius of our atom when the atom is in a covalent bond. Okay. So like um, we did those examples with um, let's see here because this is not going to work because why would it work? Uh, Yo, yeah, good. Glad that that's not working. It's real good. Makes me happy. Tableau. Display tableau. Uh, crashing again always check your setup before you actually go live um yes i do know that thanks yeah see oxygen's blue i said that yesterday like the oxygen is colored oxygen really is blue when you get it into a liquid state um 
Okay, yeah, haha, here we go. Okay, so you see this thing. Uh, this is the space filling model of oxygen. What it's trying to show is, um, seriously, what the space filling models try to show is how much space the electron cloud is taking up around the nucleus. Um, so, like, this thing right here, this hexane, cyclohexane, this is theoretically how much space is actually being taken up by the, the electron clouds for their respective atoms. So the white balls here are the hydrogen atoms and how much space their electron cloud is taking up. The black ones are the carbons and how much their space their electron clouds are taking up. The reason this is important is because if you go to something like this, so this is sulfur dioxide, this thing, if you draw out a Lewis structure for sulfur dioxide, SO2, um, and then you do the Vesper structure, which we haven't really talked about, you see that you get this uh, three-dimensional thing that kind of looks like this. Um, and even in that uh, simulation for Lewis structures, or not, for Lewis structures, but for the simulation for polarity, we had molecules that were bent. We just still drew everything with lines, like the electrons were lines. It's not true. Really what it is is this cloud-like thing around the nuclei. So if you can imagine buried in here, like where the magnifying glass is, um, you're not really seeing that very well. Now hopefully you're seeing it better buried here where the magnifying glass is inside the center is one of our oxygens. The other side is another oxygen. And here in the middle up here in this blue region is a sulfur. So we would say that the covalent radius for oxygen would be um, when we put it in a covalent molecule, typically it's going to be O2 what's half the distance between this nucleus and this nucleus? So that's a long way to explain that, but that's where that covalent radii is coming from. Okay. So the size of our atom and also thus, like thus, it's covalent radius. You could replace and with thus. Um, is going to increase as we increase the distance of the outermost electrons from the nucleus. Okay. We go back to a periodic table, and like if we go down like our halogens here, for fluorine, we've got uh, seven valence electrons. For iodine, we've God, well, let's just do chlorine because it's an easier example. Chlorine's got seven, val seven valence electrons, but the difference between fluorine and chlorine is we've gone up a principal quantum number. So we've gone from N equals 2 in fluorine to N equals 3 in chlorine. We have more electrons. Um, and so if we go back to images um, from discussion where and from the book where we can kind of predict how far out electrons are with respect to their principal quantum number. The higher the principal quantum number, we generally would expect that the electrons to be further out from the nucleus. Further out the electrons are, um, it means that when they go to share electrons, they're that atom doesn't have to get as close to another atom because that like two chlorines don't have to get as close to one another as two fluorines do in order to share electrons. We would expect the chlorine uh, radius, covalent radius, to be larger than the fluorine one Large, because we have more electrons around chlorine than we do fluorine. And so the like fluorine electrons might be like this. Chlorine are like this. If we two put two of these balls right next to one another, 
in the middle is going to be that nucleus, which is really small compared to the electron cloud. Um, two of these balls can't get as close to one another. Or like the nuclei in the center of these balls can't get as close as the nuclei in balls like this size. Does that make sense? Yeah. yeah. So I'm in a basement with a ton of kid toys. I can like go actually get physical models to help explain that if you'd like. No, it makes sense that like if there were more electrons or something, it would be a bigger atom. Mm-hmm. Um let's see if we can do this because my iPad's having problems. What's that called? Libre text. Libre, libre, libre text. Um, there we go. Okay. So this her um, diagram. Um, this is a mathematically rigorous way of explaining what I tried to explain um, just by using my hands. So if you have something like helium that only has, uh, it's got a one uh, for its principal quantum or for its valence electrons versus uh, something like neon that has two as its valence electrons principal quantum numbers. Um, if you look at where the peak is for the one S or for those valence electrons and the peak for the um, uh, two principal quantum number in the neon, that gives you an idea. Like if you just look at like most probable to most probable, the two S is further out. Uh, the two is further out than the one. If you go up from neon to argon, where you go now from two to three, the three is way out here and the two is way in here. So things that have a higher principal quantum number, we would expect on average the their size would increase because of this um, radial probability versus distance from the nuclei data that we have. So that's a more technically rigorous uh, explanation. Let's see. Yeah, here's like a here's some images of that covalent radii thing. Um, yeah, that just disappeared. Okay, let's take a look at argon. Uh, if we put two argon atoms right next to one another, um, so they're not going to form a covalent bond because argon's a noble gas, um, and so it's not going to have a covalent radius. What it's going to have is a van der Waal radius, which is listed in that uh, sheet. The difference between a van der Waal radii and a covalent radii is that whole, do you actually have a covalent bond or do you have van der Waals interactions? And we haven't gotten into van der Waals interactions right now, but just note that if you have a uh, noble gas, you're only going to have van der Waals. You're not going to have covalent. So if the distance between the two uh, nuclei is this, half of that would be your radius, specifically the van der Waal radius. But something like chlorine over here in black, that's actually kind of nice that you're seeing it that way. Between white dot here and white dot here would be our uh, bond distance. And this is going to be a covalent bond. So if we take that halfway in the middle, the halfway point to our nuclei is going to be our uh, covalent radius. Um, okay. For metals, metals kind of work the same way um, as the covalent species. It's just uh, covalent bonding is fundamentally different from metallic bonding but you can think of it the same way or you it's uh it's fundamentally different but your mind can hopefully see that yeah metals are sharing electrons it's just a different kind of sharing but the fundamental principle 
between covalent and metallic and like how you calculate it is the same. Does that help? Yes. Yeah. So okay. what, why is it, what's yes. counterintuitive about it? There's something We're counterintuitive about six. it. I'm, yeah, that's why I, I think that's what tripped me up is because I got to number six and I read it and it said this might seem counterintuitive. Okay, so as we move across <laughs> the periodic table from left to right, so let's go back to our periodic table as we go from left to right. So like, let's go from lithium to neon. Um, we generally find that the element, uh, we generally find that, uh, that each element has a smaller covalent radius than the preceding element. Okay, so punchline, or the, uh, another way of saying that would be lithium it has a larger covalent radius than, uh, or has a smaller covalent radius than the element preceding it. Um, wait, am I reading that wrong? Okay. Oh, let's put on the glasses. I don't know where the glasses are. Very good. Way to go, me. Hey, we got them. All right, as we move across the periodic table from left to right, we find that each element has a smaller covalent radius. So as we go this way, the radius gets smaller, right? So as we go from lithium to beryllium, the covalent radius gets smaller. Uh, beryllium is smaller than lithium. This might seem counterintuitive because it implies that atoms with more electrons have smaller atomic radii. Well, right, because, okay, that part might is kind of counterintuitive, right? Because we just said if you've got more, as we go down, the more electrons you have, the bigger your radius was. Because that's what, like, number five is talking about. It's really going up and down the periodic table as we go from top to bottom. Number six is talking about going left to right. So the way we, ra we rationalize going from top to bottom was, oh, more electrons... Well, we didn't really say more electrons. What we said was we're changing the principal quantum number, but we have to change the principal quantum number because we have more electrons. But we didn't say it's more electrons, and so it's getting bigger. We said it's we're changing the principal quantum number, and thus it's getting bigger. Um, but I can totally see where you would think that's part and parcel, even though it's a little different. Related, but different. So top to bottom, we're saying bigger, more electrons. We didn't say that. Left or right, we're gaining more electrons. So why aren't things getting bigger? That's what number six is referring to. The difference between going left to right is between going top to bottom is when we go left to right on the periodic table, we're not changing our principal quantum number. So from lithium all the way over to fluorine for our... Um, our principal quantum number for all of these species is still going to be two. So our electrons are still going to be, uh, have two as the principal quantum number. N will equal two for the valence electrons. What we are doing, though, is we are changing the effective nuclear charge as we go left or right. As we go left or right, we're adding more protons. What's that got to do with the price of tea in China? I'm still very, very lost. I don't... Okay, let's go back. 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 No, wait, this is it. Let's go. Okay, this is the one we want. I'm going to zoom out just a little bit because it's kind of not super clear because of how big it is. There we go. Going to do it one more time. Let's go. Okay. <laughs> Let me try to explain from the periodic table again. When we went from fluorine to iodine, what's the thing that what are, what's the things that have changed between these atoms? One, did the valent did their uh, valence electron configuration change? They have the same number of valence electrons. So the configuration did not change. Yeah. 
Yeah, because that's one of the powers of the periodic table, right? If you're in the same group, then you would expect the same valence electron configuration to exist. Um, so the valence electron configuration is pretty much the same. We also change the number of electrons, right? In the case of making things simple again, going from fluorine to chlorine, we went uh, from nine electrons to 17 electrons. Excuse me. So we added a fair number more electrons, right? Right. If you had more electrons, there is in a in a world you could say, well, more electrons should mean bigger atom. Yeah. It could mean that. What we tried to with this diagram right here, and maybe I just did such a good job explaining the diagram doubt it um what we tried to do with this diagram is say this is our problem like this purple line here is a probability curve so we can um so let's say we go 50 picometers from the nucleus the nucleus is here at zero the 50 is the disc is 50 picometers from the nucleus we can go up to the top of the curve here to this like point right mirror we could then go back to our y-axis and this like has a actual number associated with it even though it's not written out and we could say we have this probability of finding the electron at 50 picometers another way of thinking about this diagram is well how far out do we have the maximum probability of finding our electrons? So for that regard, you would go and you'd say, where's the peak of this curve? Because that's going to correspond with the highest radial probability. So you go find the peak and then you drop down to the distance. So let's say that's at 25 picometers. So we would expect to find the electrons and helium most likely here at 25 picometers. If we now go up to neon and we say, what's our valence electrons, which will be our 2s electrons and our 2p electrons? What's our highest probability of finding those suckers? So we find the peak of the curve again. We drop down and now we hit, let's say that's 30 picometers. So the distance, the, the probability, the greatest probability of finding an electron is further out from the nucleus with neon than it is for helium. The difference between helium and neon is, or the big differences here between neon and helium in terms of atomic size are going to be where we find the electrons. And where we find the electrons are going to be based off of largely the principal quantum number. The bigger that principal quantum number, the further out the electrons are going to be. With me so far? Uh, I, um, I really need to see if I can draw those. I want to say yes, but no. <laughs> no, no, no. Just be honest. Okay. I'm going to see if I can get this thing working.
capture device, video capture device. Great. And we're going to not do that because that keeps failing. We're going to do that. We're going to say, okay. And hopefully this thing is going to start working. Stop. Oh, for the love of Mike. I just really, I think if I can draw this, it's going to work. And for whatever reason, life is really let me know that it's mad at me. Come on, baby. There we go. You did it. Good old fashioned cables, FTW. All right. Now the pencil's going to die. So here's our nucleus. Right. So let's say the nucleus, uh, this is our nucleus right here. Let's say the nucleus ha um, is helium. In a really crude sense, we could say it's going to have two electrons floating around it. They're going to be occupying a space like this. Now if we go up to neon, and this is our nucleus for neon, right? So it's got a little few, it's got a few more protons, but that doesn't matter for atomic size. Atomic size is really dictated on the electron cloud. If we write out the electron configuration for these bad boys, we're going to say for helium, it's 1s2. For neon, it's... Um, 1s2, 2s2, 2p6. So what we've got in blue is our 1s electrons. What we're going to have in red are going to be the 2s and 2p electrons. And we've got a total of eight of them. So one, two, three, four, five, Six, seven, eight. Okay. The radius is going to go from here to the outermost electron space. All right, so the blue is our radius. Does that make sense? Yes. Okay. So what question six, or oh, I'm sorry, what question five is setting up for us is as we increase the principal quantum number, we're adding electrons to space because we're adding electrons, the size of the atom increases. And that's that image that we just drew. That's five. The reason six might feel counterintuitive is if we are explaining this by adding elect extra electrons, if you go from carbon to oxygen, well, carbon's valence electrons are four. Oxygen is six. Yeah. So you could say with carbon here, oops, for its nucleus, you could have one, two for the core electrons. And then one, two, three, for the valence electrons. Right? Does that image make any sense? Yes. 
for oxygen, it's going to be pretty much the same, except for you're going to have two more electrons in the valence. Okay, if we use the logic that more electrons equals bigger atom, then we would think, because oxygen's got more valence electrons, oxygen is bigger. Right. That's what six is saying, like, hey, that makes sense, right? But then it throws in immediately, no, that's wrong. And the reason it's wrong is this thing called Z effective. And Z effective is our effective nuclear charge. We talked back in general or in chapter two, two, that the effective or that the effective nuclear charge or mm, nope, nope, nope. The nuclear charge Z was equal to the number of protons. Effective nuclear charge is, okay, so that's not a great definition. Effective nu or nuclear charge is going to say, like, um, what's the charge that each electron is going to feel based off the nucleus? So if you have one electron and you have one proton, hey, you know, it's pretty much zero. Great. But effective nuclear charge is going to say, so effective nuclear charge is going to say, well, how much of the nucleus does this one electron feel? So what we have to consider is the stuff here with n equals 1 is way way closer like these electrons are way closer to the nucleus right mm -hmm. especially compared to our red circled one so like think about uh your own relationship with siblings and your parental units um if your parental units are irritated or upset you want a sibling or somebody else to be between you and said parental unit. Because if there's someone in between you and said parental unit, they kind of act like a buffer so that you don't get all of the upsetness on you or you don't get as much of the upsetness on you, right? Yeah. I mean, theoretically, that's a theoretical. You've never done anything to upset your parental units. Um, but you know people who have, maybe. Um, that's the exact same setup for Z effective. The, the nucleus has this positive charge. Um, in fact, for carbon, we're going to have what? Uh, six protons. Let's go to our periodic table. Yeah, we're going to have six protons. And for oxygen, we're going to have eight protons. worst table ever so the six protons here at the center of our carbon are interacting with those electrons in green more strongly than they are interacting with those electrons um, that are in the valency if we go over to our oxygen or so actually I should stop. Does that make sense? Yeah. yeah. Okay. So if we go over to our oxygen, oops, and we say, how much does this oxygen get a feel of that Z effective? Now we have to think through 
how many protons do we have here in the center? And how much of a job are these core electrons doing to prevent our electron on the outside from feeling the positive pull or the positive, yeah, the positive uh, charge of our protons. In carbon's case, we had six protons and two electrons. It's six protons for two core electrons. In oxygen's case, we have eight protons for two core electrons. If you look at that ratio, it's a six to two versus an eight to two. The six to two ratio is like less than the eight to two ratio. Buying that so far? Yeah. Okay. So the core electrons over here for our carbon can do more shielding for the valence electrons of our carbon because that ratio is less. The core electrons for our oxygen, they cannot do as good a shielding because there's more protons for only the two electrons. Okay. Because they do it because the core elect because the core electrons in oxygen can't provide as good a shielding. What that tells us is the electron. Uh, it's got to be another color. Uh, orange. The electrons here in orange, like that's getting oranged, are being pulled into a closer proximity to the nucleus because those electrons in green just can't shield them enough. Oh. Okay. So that's like, that's, that's shielding uh, an effective nuclear charge. And then that helps, that's exp the punchline behind six. Oops, what did we do? Oh no, oh no. Ah, whew. Okay, we made it, we made it. I deleted a bunch of stuff, but we got back there. Oh my gosh. Um, so the punchline here for number six is, yeah, just because we gain more electrons doesn't mean that our atom's getting bigger. It does when we go down on the periodic table, but as we go across on the periodic table, the thing we need to be taking into consideration is shielding. And turns out shielding gets worse and worse as you go across the periodic table. So it means that atoms are going to get smaller and smaller as you go across the periodic table. Get my fat head out of the way of the uh, row two here. So we start out with something like with lithium, which should be crazy well shielded, like its valence electron should be crazy well shielded. And you go all the way over here to something like fluorine, and fluorine is this small little sucker because those valence electrons just, you know, like are getting the wrath of the, the nucleus because the core electrons just can't shield against all of the protons that our fluorine has. Okay. So yeah, like when you think it through, it is completely intuitive. It's just like we're trying to acknowledge it might be counterintuitive if you're only counting electrons. Because counting electrons is the wrong thing to do. Yeah. Mostly. That makes sense. But I'm really glad that I spent the time to rehook up that wire because that was going to be really hard to explain otherwise. I might not, might or might not just be livid about that software failure. What you gonna do? What else? 
else would you like to talk about? Uh, well, that was pretty much it. Okay. Um. Yeah. So what I'm going to suggest, and I'll drop this link in the YouTube uh, description, but I'll also drop it in chat now because that's a fun sentence to say. Um, if I can find the chat. Oh, my gosh. Zoom. You're really just like practically the bane of my existence. Oh, just paste the thing. Okay. There is a link to a, a resource like that the uh, the resource I've been using for this video um, regarding some images and things of that nature. So uh, if your book is not being helpful, this might be pretty helpful. Okay. Hint, hint, nudge, nudge. Yeah. Electron shielding and nuclear effect. It's almost like the drawing that I did, except for maybe better. I don't know. I think mine wasn't bad this time. I'm actually quasi. Okay, that drawing's better. That drawing's a little better. But I still feel pretty good about my drawing. Still feel pretty good. Electron penetration. Oh, man. This is the fun stuff. I'm more than happy to help out with whatever. Uh, I also don't want to soak up all your bandwidth. I think that I'm good on other stuff. So. Okay. Did you get the emails uh, about, or the email about the test and the, um, the rules for the test and the uh, assignment space for yes. uploading your work? Okay, cool. Yep. Cool, cool, cool. All righty. Well, uh, let me know if you have any other questions. Will do. Have a good day. You too. Bye-bye.